so good evening to you all we're going to start another very interesting session this call is about 2018 title the myths about paraguay myths are generally due to misinformation or the absence of uh, the right information so we have here the men to give the right information about the paraguay and uh, what they are saying is your fears are not justified and they are here to give them all the myths over to them so my role here is very simple is that of a devil certificate to shoot the questions regarding myths to them and to get the right information from them and i'll start with the uh, dr dayan sir the first one we are all well versed with the who food pyramid isn't it we have learned it since our college days it's a scientific test of balanced diet the popular myth is following it properly addresses almost all the health issues what's the need of any alternative good evening everyone we as a doctors we know how to prescribe people and uh, treat people based on their issues but we never know how the policy framework is done and we just believe that the policies which are framework by institutions are for our own good and we take it that stand and we advise that based on that and coming to this the food pyramid was basically framed on the basis that the historical perspective says that whoever makes it for that we are the ones responsible like i am a glutton or a sloth i don't have much of physical activity that is why i am obese i eat over about the recommendations and that's why i am obese but frankly it is not it has lot of connections to it we as doctors look only the medical aspect but if you look into it how the food pyramid was framed then you will know the consequences in the afternoon session dr harigan could have enlightened you on the lipid hypothesis based on ansel keys and there was a mega select committee on 1968 77 which was framed on the basis of uh, ansel keys and they were the ones who were responsible for the development of food pyramid which was officially launched on 1980 and you have to understand an important shocking is that the food pyramid was actually framed by us development for agriculture so you have to understand that their agricultural interest and they wanted to promote these kind of foods which are corn wheat and everything and that is why they gave large subsidies to farmers and that is the reason why these uh, food prices were coming down whereas the old foods including animals and other plants became expensive so obviously the farming community was given incentives and since the agriculture association framed the diet they concentrated on all the industries which were based on agriculture predominantly the sugar corn and the sugar lobby was very much and that when they asked for evidences for the bengal committee they told that we were having no time to give you evidences since there is lot of facts available already on the lipid hypothesis we have to go frame the charts and in fact there was a lot of uh, controversies when the chart official pyramid was formed and you can see that contrary to widespread opinion but too much sugar in your diet does not seem to keep cause diabetes and there is also no convincing evidence that sugar causes heart disease but the mindset so they framed the chart in which the sugars were on the base where you were uh, seeing lot of uh, sugar on the base of the sun and the facts were kept at the low but philip pandler at that time itself mentioned that since you are going to deal with a large number of population reframing a pyramid you are going to put lot of people in trouble and that resulted in less saturated fats less calories more polyunsaturated vegetable oils more carbohydrate and starches and more in inexpensive food commodities but the evidence was weak and this if at all has sir question should have brought down the obesity rates but for your shocking if you see this evidence after the dietary guidelines the frame and since america is the one organization which is responsible for forming out the framework for a lot of other countries in the world the obesity epidemic shoot up and if you can see the carbohydrate intake of each person has shoot up this is a graph showing the intake of the fat carbohydrate and the protein the fat has come down the carbohydrate has increased but you can see the obesity rates has significantly increased if this food pyramid was to be the reason why you all have the bfd then what do you ask for these statistics 
So I would all, always say that whatever the food pyramids started with focusing too much of the carbs which form the base of the pyramid and the oils and the fats which are at the top of the pyramids which are less is actually faulty and that is why Dr. Farooq Abdullah told very clearly that we have just upturned the food pyramid resulting in we have an increased fat intake and lesser carb then you don't have to have a lot of issues we see nowadays. Okay, thank you. That shows that the pyramid should be reversed. It's time to read the medical books. And again, a question to Dr. Safi. The term paleo is just a fashionable term. It's a, just a term to misguide the masses, many people say. And uh, this also is saying there's no proper archaeological proof what ancient man or woman ate and how healthy he or she was. Who knows? Good question. But I wonder, how can values become a fashionable term? It's an old form of diet, but they say it's a fashionable term to misguide masses. Which mass to misguide? Because almost everybody has Google, everybody search everything. You stand in the gold market, you search what is the gold price of the current day. You are not going to get mis misguided just because of the term value. Right? Diet of an archaeological man. Fossils, this is uh, like how they search what men ate, how where he, where he lived, what was his uh, culture. This recently the archaeological people do it with this type of fossils. It's a petrified remain bones, wood, etc., hard and rock like. Some are all of the original metals have been replaced with minerals. For example, water flowing over and through the bone may dissolve the calcium in the bone and replace it with quartz. The scientific name of this of this quartz in the bone. So looking at it, there are some isotopes they have seen like uh, oxygen isotopes and nitrogen, carbon. With this, you can see what, what they learn is diet of a geographic origin and the diet of that particular uh, fossil, they have taken example nitrogen <coughs> from the bone and ivory, carbon from bone, marble and shells. So all of the things they use for geographic origin and dating are like the, how many years they have lived. Right. <coughs> the other form of evidence is the type of tooth they have collected. Dentists should be knowing. Uh, I hope you didn't say it. Can you raise your hands, dentist? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. These are from bones. See the difference of skull from the archaeological man and current skull. The brain case shape, the brow ridge, the nasal brow projection, the cheek, angulation chin. Everything relates with eating meat. How they chew, how they hold it, how they uh, like, uh, how they use their teeth and their chin and the uh, macular area to be. Example, dentist should be knowing. Look at the incisors. It's like almost shovel shaped incisors to catch hold of meat and bite it. And because they don't have all this cooking material and mixing and all this building items, everything, they usually have raw meat and raw cooked meats, half cooked meats. Then the biting strengths of them. Uh, then the uh, uh, main thing is the molars. The Boys say to molar and the erectus molar. They have one, two, three, four, five to chew. They, they need that, that much of uh, tooth to chew it. Shovel shaped incisors to catch hold of the meat or the strong food they want to eat. Then, this is the bone uh, thing where. Uh, Mostly they, they were used the fossils we have seen, diet high in meat. Then just imagine if they can have uh, they would have eaten uh, rice or millets or wheat or thing, why do they need all these extraordinary instruments? These instruments are used to kill animals, to, to hunt. These are some evidence in the journals regarding animal source foods and uh, human health during evolution. You can check it out in the Journal of Nutrition. So this was a hominid evolution. Almost like we have, they have uh, conducted uh, the study from that part. Usually we take from this boy's eye, the pink line. 
till Homo sapiens, so almost a 3 million years. Lifetime, yeah, there was a question, oh, what was their lifespan? 40 to 45 years maximum lifespan because they had arthritis, they had mainly gum disease, nobody brushed their teeth, they don't know what is Colgate. <laughs> Fractured skull, neck stab, because everybody, two things, they used to hunt or they used to scavenge. If they can't, if the young people are the very healthy people, they hunt. The old people are uh, females who, who can't hunt, they go, go scavenge the dead animals and they eat. So think about the infections and all other communicable diseases they had. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Hey, Dr. Suresh, I would like to know from you. So it's, uh, as you all know, we have learned that reducing weight is about counting calories. We have learned that more food and less food makes one a fat boy or girl. Doing it other ways makes one slim and trim. What do you say on that? So the traditional model of obesity, you know, it is based on calories in and calories out hypothesis. So whenever a person is overeating, there is an increased energy intake. This coupled with decreased energy expenditure because of sedentary lifestyle, there is positive energy balance because there is increased circulating metabolic fumes in the circulation. This surplus energy gets converted into fat. There is progressive accumulation of fat mass and a person becomes obese and overweight. Agreed. So the traditional advice is to eat less and move more. But we all know in the long term, this has not been found to be helpful for long term weight loss management. If the case has been so, we will not be here discussing the panel. So if, if a person is overeating, is there a possibility for an additional factor which makes him to overeat than what he can expand? Now let us see the alternative hormonal model of obesity. <coughs> so whenever the food rich in dietary carbohydrates, the normal physiological response, you know, increase insulin secretion. Insulin is a hormone, it's a master hormone, anabolic hormone. It is necessary for glucose uptake in the cells to provide energy for all cellular functions. But in a state of hyperinsulinemia, energy partitioning takes place. The surplus glucose energy in the circulation along with lipids gets converted into fat, de novo lipogenesis. As a result, in the circulation there is energy deficit. This energy deficit reflects in decreased energy expenditure. Your basal metabolic rate goes down. Now individual becomes fatty. So energy expenditure goes down as well as the, the person will be always hungry. So he resorts to increased energy intake. This cycle goes on and on. As a consequence, there is progressive fat mass accumulation and a person becomes obese. So the take home message is energy content of the food does matter. But what really matters is the quality of these calories, its impact on the hormone stimulation of insulin or satiety signals like cholecystokinin and peptide Y. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Since we are running short of time, I request the panelists to the Kashadar Arbikus to around two minutes. We have a lot of messages to cover. More than information, lot of misinformation suspecting about value. The aim of the session is to dispel all those myths. So we'll go to the next question. Dr. Shafi, yes, So we have read that uh, pulses, legumes, soya are full of proteins. They are called poor man's meat. And the uh, wheat has been uh, proposed as uh, something better than rice. <coughs> Millets have come up as superfoods. And Paddy, Paddy, you are asking us to avoid all these things. Are we right? Yeah, pulses, legumes, soya, protein rich, beef is better than rice. Millets, yeah, superfoods. I would say all these things are wrong. Everything is right. But who's going to eat all these things? Are we eating right? Uh, all these foods are right, but uh, for whom? What is a good protein? It has been uh, assessed with this four scores. Biological value, which we have all read in medicine, uh, undergraduate. Like we know the complete protein, 100% of biological value. Then the protein efficiency ratio, chemical score and PDCSS. Everybody is fond of this cake. 
Everybody know this game. Do you think this is protein rich? Raise your hands. How many think this is protein rich? Nobody thinks. What about this? This is our usual meal. Tali. Protein rich? Okay. Chapati with dal. Protein? Anybody thinks this is protein rich? One. Okay. Idli. There's 40 calories, 0.19 grams of carbs, 7.89 grams of uh, carbs, 0.1 fat, then protein is 1.91. There are 40 calories on a piece of idli. So, what kind of protein we get in a multigrain flour and a whole wheat flour? Just, uh, just notice that multigrain is 14.41, 400 grams, but in the wheat, whole wheat is 12.2. Okay. This is, we are all no protein becomes into amino acids. There are two types of amino acids, essential and non-essential. For this essential is very important for us. Example, beans. I am uh, explaining only essential amino acids. Uh, take a, a list of beans. The essential amino acids, branch chain is leucine, isolase and lysine. Just look at the inner square 1000, outer square is 2000. Look at the uh, graphs given. What we usually take is just not between 1000 and 2000 beans, one cup of serving. Look at this. The inner circle is 2000, the outer circle is 4000. So, the essential amino acids that are the branching amino acids is that little much in meat. Example, beef. Beef is the top row. Chicken breast, pork, and turkey. So, this is one another thing uh, to know the protein value. Soy bean is high, but our, our previous speakers would have studied you about the uh, ingredient of soy, soy bean. Look at this, animal protein. Chicken, grill, bones, skinless, it is 81% of protein. The same thing for all other meats. Millets, a super food. So that is the question. Look at protein in the millet. So sad. See? Uh, that the rice 6.8, all the things are very less. But the carbohydrates, it's same. There is not even a single difference. It's almost 70, 69, 70, 65. But we recommend millets for diabetics. Saying that, control your blood sugar. Look at the uh, uh, carbohydrate into rice and prosomilin or uh, kambu, ragi. The, this one. Look at the protein content. So, I think protein content is justified. It is better. It's digestible in uh, meat and the complete protein should be A. Thank you. Dr. Suresh, uh, people often say that is just a meat eating diet, curry finger diet. And not much of options in that diet. Morning eggs, after meat, night meat. And particularly for vegetarians, it's uh, even more uh, difficult to follow people's say. What do you say on that? Of course, paleo nutrition is not about eating only animal foods. It emphasizes elimination of toxins like refined oils, refined sugars, chemical preservatives, omega-6 fatty acids, industrially processed vegetable oils. However, the main nutritional challenge is to provide adequate protein, micronutrients, vitamin D, vitamin B12, which all in vegetarian meat diet. So this is a sample, it's not an exhaustive list. So if you see the low-carb friendly plant foods, the characteristic is low in carb content, low glycemic index, rich in fibers and a good ratio of proteins and fats is provided in the form of nuts and we have the fiber rich seeds, chia seeds and flex seeds. They are a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. And being a lacto vegetarian, accommodating dairy products and egg, it will give you a social and behavioral flexibility for vegetarians, if not for ethical reasons, for health issues, they can easily go for being a lacto vegetarian. So, in a way, how to overcome micronutrient deficiency, vitamin B12, iron and vitamin D, it can easily be overcome by including a lot of green leafy vegetables. They are known as gut fertilizers. They are rich in digestible fibers. The gut bacteria acts on these fibers, resulting in production of such a so small chain fatty acids like butyrate, propionate, which are all good nutrients for the intestinal mucosa. And of course, dark chocolates, whenever there is craving, is a good source of antioxidant.
And as I said, white sugar is a no no. We all accept that it's industry made, it's not good for health. But what about jaggery and palm sugar? Aren't they good? And the fruits are good too. I heard my friend saying, Kali, you are crazy to say no even to fruits. Well, everybody has a sweet tooth and we are all addicted to sweets, and that's why we always try to find a way where we can include fruits. But if you look at the difference, I have mentioned it, the ingredients, the nutritive value of all the three essential things which we compare. A lot of people say jaggery is a better alternative. Instead of sugar, I put uh, jaggery and have a tea and that's good, healthy because you get jaggery. But if you look at the uh, ratios, jaggery is nothing but 95% carbohydrates, which is as equal to as uh, refined sugar. The only difference is sugar requires a little more chemicals for refining, otherwise jaggery is as equal as sugar. And one more thing, a lot of people say honey. And when you look at the honey, it has a combination of fructose, glucose and maltose. And that also has a carb value of 82%. So for your mental satisfaction, you may think that you are taking natural ingredients and those are not harmful, but biochemically, body understands by chemicals. And what goes inside beyond your 6 inch tongue, everything is chemical. So what you put in, body considers whether it's sugar, fat or protein. So ultimately all the three are the same. And a lot of people give too much hype on jaggery saying that there are a lot of nutrients, especially iron, all those stuff. But you look at the iron content, it's very minimal. You can't even consider it for giving it for people on a long term basis. And a study, not even I say, there are a lot of studies which are done in uh, diabetes back then, compared to giving jaggery and sugars, and ultimately the blood sugar levels always rises. And one of the things, the most reason why people crave for food is there is a lack of in protein and proteins are deficient and that is why we have a craving food. Once the satiety fills in and you adequate protein, it is more of a protein deficiency and we have to try to correct that rather than focusing on I don't take sugars, instead I take jacket which is natural so I am So this is a comparison and lastly fruits. The fruits, a lot of people give a hype but they don't really go for the fructose. See, if you are on maintenance, that's a different story, but if you want, if you are extremely obese, if you are having uh, diabetes, you have to bring your uh, hormonal levels to a level where your sugar doesn't increase the insulin spike. And if you compare, the one apple has 4.5 cubes of sugar, which is equivalent to what you get in uh, another product which is having a lot of sugars. Ultimately, body things, fructose, if there is already excess energy, it is going to be stored in the fat and produce fat in liver. And that is the reason why we in Tamil value doesn't encourage fruits. Whereas the westernized value, their lifestyle is different, climatic conditions is different, we are on tropical basis. We need, uh, we don't have to spend a lot of energy to run our metabolic status. And we do concentrate on the fructose having a significant in intake on the metabolic activities. Ultimately, all these names might sound Phonetically good, make you satisfied that I'm making natural, but they're all sugars in different names. That's all. To Suresh, you know, low carb, you're saying. Don't they feel tired, hungry, exhausted, hypoglycemic? We all learned that carbohydrate is essential nutrient. See, essential nutrients are nutrients which our body cannot make. So they have to be obtained on a daily basis from food sources. We do have essential amino acids, we do have essential fatty acids. But there is no such thing as essential carbohydrate molecule till date. The RDA for carbohydrates is 130 grams per day. This is based on brain heat carbs idea. So you see an integrated nutritional biochemistry pathway where in the presence of low carb nutrition, the metabolism glucose homeostasis is maintained through gluconeogenesis. Endogenous glucose production takes place at the rate of 2 to 2.5 mg per kg per minute on an average 210 to 250-260 grams per day. And lipolysis takes place, there is mobilization of fatty acids and enters into the citric acid cycle. When there is, there is overproduction of acetyl CoA, then the ketogenesis takes place because we run short of the intermediates oxaloacetate which is diverted into the gluconeogenesis. So low carb nutrition maintains glucose homeostasis, ketosis as well as promotes weight loss. So we are in a, our metabolism is 
diet neglected. If we are on a carb based diet, we land up in carb based metabolism and we develop an insulin resistant phenotype of metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes and obesity. If you are on a well formulated low carb diet, naturally we develop fat based metabolism and a keto adapted phenotype. It occurs when you take less than 20 grams of carbohydrates and we achieve normal weight, active and enhanced physical performance. This comes with a metabolic advantage. There is high energy of cost of gluconeogenesis. For one glucose molecule to be converted into pyruvate, one two ATPs are produced. Whereas from pyruvate, again gluconeogenesis, six ATPs are required. So we have a one-on-one -on -one advantage by gluconeogenesis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Running short of time, I request the panelists to need to just just rest too fast. We have lot more to cover. And next is a very uh, much expected question. Uh, Paleo is a very high protein diet. I read high protein is injurious to kidneys. Paleo diet is not a kidney chutney. People say <laughs> that is the most talked question. And uh, first of all, uh, the misconception is just because we take a lot of meat doesn't mean that paleo is a high protein diet. In fact, it's a low carbohydrate, high fat, and a moderate protein. See, we Indians, we take very less amount of proteins compared to Westerners. Westerners who have a lot of meat, they didn't have that. But just because we are taking a lot of meat doesn't mean that we are taking very high proteins. See, the typical Indian takes around 30 to 40 grams. If you take the, all the rice, which uh, Safi sir was saying, all those, if you calculate, it just comes around 30 grams. So what we prescribe is around 80 to 100 grams, which is high protein diet on an average. And this again varies for an individual. See, uh, the minimalistic protein required, as we know, is around 0.7 to 1 gram per kilogram. And for an 80 gram uh, male, it's around 60 to 80. And for certain conditions like in pregnancy, childbirth, and for children, we ask them to take a little more protein because it requires much more. So anything less will lead to muscle wasting. So what maximum can it take? So what is the maximum limit? You have told me the minimalistic limit. What is the maximum limit? See, the maximum limit for an healthy adult, you can go up to 2.5 grams. There is a research paper stating that they've taken a lot of uh, protein up to 2.5 grams, followed the patients, uh, persons, who are doing physical activity and didn't have any metabolic side effects. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Arun for giving me this uh, kitchen sink analogy. A lot of people say when you take high protein, it produces a strain on kidneys. Whereas if you take, if you consider one sink which is unblocked, the other sink which is blocked, and if you run water, obviously you will know the one which is blocked will get filled. And that is how same analogy can be taken for considering protein. So if you are taking a protein in a normally functioning healthy kidneys, whatever you take, your kidneys will be able to adapt because our kidneys are able to adapt physiologically. That is why even in transplant, when the donor gives off the one kidney, a person survives with one kidney because the kidney can adapt and perform accordingly. It enlarges and takes over the role and that is why it's able to do. So for a physiologically healthy pain, uh, when you take an adequate protein coupled with an exercise, it then tends to not cause any harmful effects. What are the changes which happens when you take a lot of proteins? Then initially, the GFR had a lot of misconception. The research in GFR has gone significantly up, and now we are knowing that the GFR increase initially was thought to have a lot of effects. Like, see, if the GFR is increased, then the kidneys are under strain. That is, in fact, a misconception because the recent studies on GFR says. GFR tends to increase as a physiological adaptation and there are a lot of studies to prove that and that one is known as hyperfiltration. The increase in the size and volume of global or functional units and such changes are also seen in kidney donors, the composite kidney. These are the studies to highlight that the hyperfiltration is not the cause for worry. If the point was well received there. So, Dr. Safi, let me know. Follow the philosophy of diet, take meat daily. They take, off, uh, take a lot of red meat too. <coughs> you fear that they will end up in some cancer. Uh, yes. Uh, we do take a lot of red meat. This might end up in cancer. Uh, can anyone uh, guess what cancer is common in red meat? Huh? Polar cancer. Any other, any other cancer? Sir? Pancreatic. Any other? Okay, right. So, 
risk of colon cancer. Just imagine, quit smoking, get enough vitamin D, eat fiber rich food, avoid unnecessary antibiotic, what we already described. Eat cancer fighting with drink less alcohol, excess daily, fight obesity, get regular screenings. The only fourth point is cut red unprocessed meat from your diet. Highlight that red unprocessed meat, right? What is red meat? WHO classification says red meat, they uh, classify is 1, 2, A, 2, B, 3, and 4. The one is sausages, corn dogs, bacon, and salami. That is called processed meat. This, uh, the 2 A comes probable causes cancer, that meat including pork, beef and lamb. It comes under 2 A, okay? So, red meat cancer is assessed with uh, processed meat, red meat and then all other tobacco, alcohol and food. Just imagine the count with the tobacco, it comes more than a, uh, a lamb and the above, but processed red meat just 24,000. Uh, red meat is causally is proven as 50,000, but they are not proven in it. This, what happens inside when we take red meat? Heme, uh, like the meat has heme ion, it changes into a nitric oxide. Inside the stomach, the nitric oxide, uh, along with the metabolites, causes n nitrosome compounds. This n nitrosome compound is commonly seen without the heme ion in processed meats. This n nitrosome compound is a very common. Uh, I'll see it in the processed meats, but the red meat has to transform it into the uh, uh, endless compound with the amides inside the stomach, right? So, the observation studies, what they did with this meat intake is, they did it with few animal experiments, experiment that to mouse. They just imagine giving meat to mouse, okay? So, the correlated pathogenesis is, what they did is giving uh, red meat more and red meat less, they, they proved that inflammatory carcinogenic effects are more with red meat, mucus and anti inflammatory animal effects are more with whole grains and vegetables. This is a very important slide because you all said colorectal cancer is common. Genetics, immune system, microbiota. Are, is, are we keeping our microbiota safe? Are our, is our genetics pre preventable for a cancer? Is our immune system uh, pro protective? What about the diet? The diet is one of the factors, right? And small analogy. If the floor is your uh, red paint, your shoe is your immune system, microbiota and your genetics. The banana peel is processed peel. Think, imagine Will you fall with this stamp or with this stamp? Right. So, cancer risk, colorectal cancer response is mean, caused by so many other factors. One of the factor is red meat, that too processed red meat. This will not end well eating processed meat always. So, the red meat is not at all the cause for colorectal cancer and it's not proven well. Thank you. Okay, uh, ketosis. How can it be safe? Um, patient says that I develop acidosis and I might end up in an ICU like a DKA patient. After all, we have learned that ketosis only in DKA patients. Ketosis is a physiological state where ketones serve as a metabolic fuel for all vital organ functions. Glycolysis and glucose oxidation provides energy, whereas in ketosis, which occurs in low carb nutrition as well as in a faster state, it is an alternative energy source. It also takes part, enters into the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria and takes part in the ATP generation along with the electron transport chain. So how the panic is, it's confusion with diabetic ketosis. Ketoacidosis which occurs in type 1 diabetic patients as well as in type 2 diabetic patients when they have secondary infection. In diabetic ketoacidosis, there is absolute insulin deficiency. Because of absolute insulin deficiency, there is continuous streaming of fatty acids from the fat stores. So excess fatty acids reaches the liver and we have seen that it results in ketone body formation. So we have a condition where there is increased fatty acids in the circulation, excess ketone body formation and ketones in the circulation. So as well as hepatic glucose output is also high. So, hyperglycemia, hyperketonemia. As a result, 
there is acid base imbalance acidic ph osmotic diuresis fatal dehydration hypotension and shock so it's an absolute medical emergency whereas nutritional ketosis there is insulin regulated process feedback control mechanism is there because our body retains the base of insulin secretion so there is only minimal mobilization of fatty acids minimal ketone body formation so nk happens as i said earlier if you go carbohydrate restriction as low as between 20 to 50 grams of carbs so we have all evolved it is a nutritional it's an evolutionary primal molecule and it cannot happen in a person who can retain dk cannot happen in a person a normal individual who retains insulin secretion Yeah. Daily. So I, think, I think this question was discussed in the afternoon and uh, there's a lot of controversies regarding broiler chicken. The main reason highlighted is could it be hormone and could that be increased estrogen levels in chicken and could that be a cause for the early uh, this? and that's just a sim simple graph could give you a lot of analogy that you give too much importance to the chicken which weighs around 3 grams and gives you just 1.8 nanograms of estrogen and compare that with one cup of soya milk which gives you almost 30,000 nanograms and then if you could wonder what's doing with hormones I'll give you one more shocking data now this one there is 1.9 grams of estrogen which was found in implanted beef but if you compare that with the potatoes, you get around 225 nanograms. If you take the peas, estrogen value in peas, it's around 340 nanograms. For an ice cream, you get around 520 nanograms. And compare that with a chicken, it just gives you 1.8 nanograms. And there is so much of hype into it. And there's been a lot of stats saying that in 1957, the chicken grew like this. And over a period of years, the size of the chickens increased. Would that be due to hormones? Well, that's a question of controversy because there are a lot of things which I need to clarify. First is the science. One thing is hormones are not effective. If you have to understand, growth hormone is a protein. And the protein gets metabolized very fast. You don't have storage like fat. So if you are going to give a hormone injection, growth hormone injection, you have to give daily. And in order to give daily for thousands or hundreds of chickens daily, it is practically not feasible. And second thing, as I said earlier, for the volume they do, everybody daily, one person going catching each and injecting hormone daily doesn't work. And second thing, we work on economics. See, if I run an industry, I should be profitable. And if I am going to spend too much money on hormones and if that's not going to be feasible, then there's no point doing it. So first is the high cost. Considering the cost of the hormone injection is much more than the cost of the chicken itself. And that too, if you have to inject daily, it's practically not possible. And second thing is the negative impact. So if you give hormones, the growth of the chicken will be very fast than the physiological needs. The, the chicken does not have to stand, it has to gain a, I mean, hold its own weight. So if you analyze all those things, the growth is very fast, the mortality will be 40% higher. If you are doing it, if you, if you, if you try giving hormones to the chicken, Growth of the chicken is very fast for the chicken to adapt, the mortality will be high. And there's no point in me running a business with high mortality. The mortality is goes up to 40 percent. But what we need to worry about is a lot of uh, poultry in India are raised with high amount of antibiotics. And that is why we in our Tamil group say don't take the internal organs, don't take the liver of the chicken. Don't take the internal organs because they are the organs which the uh, antibiotic residues do get it. But as I said earlier, eating a chicken is far better than eating a junk. And finally, the chickens are bigger today because of three reasons. One is genetic selection, second is feed efficiency. Previously, they were against a lot of, uh, like how we have been, there's an improvement in the lifespan of our growth. There's been a like, increase in lifespan for the chicken and good quality growth feeds are given. That is why they are high. I hope this clarifies most of the questions. And one other thing which I wanted to say is that we focus on one particular like broiler chicken alone. Like uh, today after Shankarji was saying, I would say too much energy for a woman at an younger age. See, when uh, my mother was uh, younger, she wouldn't have been given a lot of opportunity to take high amount of uh, energy rich foods. 
We don't hesitate to give our two-year-old girl child a junk of uh, garbage just to stop her crying. We give them ice cream, we give them a lot of stuff. And those high energy leads to high concentrations of uh, insulin and high storage of fat. And you already know that the animals are took to the class. Too much fat is the, re the fat is the reason you are female, I am male. And when that too much harm kicks in, I think that is the reason for a lot of uh, premature thing which is coming up of recent age. Because these stats were seen in abroad, and now we are catching up with abroad with their lifestyle. We are keeping the pattern nowadays. Because that is the reason I feel rather than focusing on one particular uh, food as the reason for the premature onset for uh, puberty. Thank you. So, one last question to Dr. Safi. So, we are taking eggs at each meal. Too many eggs. So, there are two not plus any problem. Too many eggs meat. Meat is already discussed, I think. So, let me, let me say something about eggs. Just wanted to ask how many is too many? Can anybody say how many eggs per day? Eight. Ten. Eight. 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 Okay. I mean, 25 and 24. Years. Okay. <laughs> So, these are the nutrition information about egg. Can you imagine a single egg? Huh? So, what are eggs? Eggs, we know protein rating is 100. Even the fish is less, 70. What we think the superior protein is fish, we will be limited, uh, but the egg is 100. Soy beans is 47. What we respect, soy beans is 47. So, egg nutrition. How many people eat only white? Egg white. Safe. Egg white. Safe. Look. White. Fat zero. Saturated fat zero. Cholesterol zero. Carbon zero. Protein four. Okay. So, the main ingredient of fat and cholesterol is in the yolk. You throw it to your dog. <laughs> the dog is healthy. You are diseased. Eight egg whites and four, four whole eggs. Just compare the protein. Compare the carbs, compare the fats, compare the calories, compare the fats, just eight egg whites, zero. The dog is healthy. Okay. So the link is between the eggs and the heart disease, right? Everybody say, Uta Samta, Puchuko, Ninja Puchuko, Okay. This is one interesting review. Probably would have asked him. Not in WhatsApp, probably. Okay. Very interesting this is. I relate the same thing with eggs. See, they have selected 2000 cases. Huh? <laughs> with the eligibility criteria, validated or whatever, model and pass up the medical status, the included studies had at least two groups, married and unmarried, diverse and unmarried, you know, uh, we know also. Just I cannot imagine how these people are doing all these studies. Huh? In conclusion, being married appears to be associated with lower cardiovascular mortality, like eggs. <laughs> and then the excess of CBD is there, the population and the mortality having uh, to my kind of So, uh, right, uh, links between dietary factors and uh, CHT. A study, look at the last point. Insufficient value of assumption is percent for intake of supplement vitamin EC, saturated and polysaturated fatty acids, total fat, inorganic acid, meat, eggs, and milk. There ends the point. So the big U turn from 2008 to 2018, this is 18, just look at the thing. You can read it, but I don't have. Shall I read it? Okay. So from 2008 to 2018, a big U turn. Egg is bad in 2008. It's very, very good in 2018. We, are, we have to anticipate they will lost ourselves. So don't throw your dogs. Thank you. So that's the end of session. That's the verdict. Facts presented by our uh, panelists, this input panel. Four we uh, unfold this and they declare that. Uh, so let me submit the bug and I thank the organizers for this opportunity. And uh, the questions will be taken at the end of the next session. Okay. So I thank the organizers for this opportunity and uh, I thank the expert panelists for such an elaborate explanation for, for all the myths. And thank you for your participation. Thank you.